In my talk, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about some aspects that maybe haven't been talked about much so far in this meeting, and that has to do with computational theoretical neuroscience and how we actually make sense of the incredible data sets that are being assembled uh, everywhere, including here at the Allen Institute. Uh, Alan Jones showed up a slide yesterday uh, where he uh, had a spectrum of, of problems and structures and, and issues in neuroscience that went from left to right. On the left were the cells and the synapses and the molecules. On the right was behavior, cognition, consciousness, even thought. And uh, he talked about how the challenge is to go from the left to the right and to somehow find ways to connect these different levels of understanding uh, about what the nervous system looks like and what it does. And I think one of the main ingredients that will be looming large in the near future, in the next few years, is connectivity. Uh, connectivity, uh, specifically in the context of uh, what is an emerging field out there, uh, complex systems and complex networks. That's a, a topic that's talked about a lot in, in other disciplines, uh, including social sciences and technology and engineering, but also increasingly in biology. And what I want to talk to you about today is a little bit give you an idea of where that field is, uh, how it can be applied, I think, uh, uh, fruitfully, begin to be applied to the nervous system, and how we might make, make progress uh, using tools from network science and complex systems to understand how the brain is structured and how it works. So a very brief uh, overview of that at the beginning. Uh, then I'll talk about efforts to map the human brain non-invasively using technology that cannot reveal the brain in all its intricacy uh, at, at this point although I fully endorse Zumu's uh, wish list item of the non-invasive mapping or recording of individual neural activity in the human brain. I hope that will come up uh, in the near future at some point. Uh, and then at the end, I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, some of the open uh, avenues that, 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 that we can pursue using these approaches also in the, in the near future. Uh, complex systems are everywhere. Uh, we are part of complex systems uh, more and more uh, as we are connected in societies, in, techno in technological applications with the internet and so forth. And social scientists have made a lot of progress in characterizing and modeling and predicting the behavior of complex systems at the social and technological level. For instance, on the upper left, the commuting pattern of people in the United States on a county by county basis is used to predict the outbreak and the spread of epidemics. Uh, for example, uh, 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 as, as was done in tracking real time uh, data uh, last fall uh, for the um, swine flu uh, epidemic, which then did not quite materialize. Uh, on the upper right, uh, whether we can retire comfortably in the future or not, depends on the integrity of the global financial system. And the near collapse of that system in the fall of 2008 triggered calls to do a better job of predicting and modeling uh, that particular complex network to be able to uh, predict the outcome of perturbations to it and, and, and chart its integrity. In, in also in real time. So in social technological applications, people are also at my institution actually are very active in trying to collect data uh, uh, that are network data essentially about human interactions and dynamic uh, flow of people and, and goods and, and interactions and predict the global outcomes that these systems actually produce. The key message is the global outcomes, whether a system collapses or not, how resilient it is against damage, whether a epidemic spreads or does not spread, uh, depend upon the interactions of individual components, in this case mostly people and what they do. And these things can be modeled despite the fact that people are very complicated things. Every one of us thinks of ourselves as being very complex and, and intricate and autonomous and independent of all this other stuff. And yet, when it comes to these complex systems, we behave as particles. We can actually be approximated with very few system variables, with very few relevant aspects of our behavior, and global outcomes can be predicted quantitatively in these areas. I think that gives us some hope that maybe we can do the same thing also for the nervous system. Biological systems, systems biology, genomics, uh, network approaches there make a difference already in the context of charting the interactions of protein molecules inside cells to understand how these interactions give rise to global changes in cell differentiation or the transition of a cell from a normal to a, to a mutant status, etc. And in the brain, I believe we also are poised to make that step going from the understanding of individual components to the understanding of global system outcomes, including perhaps at some point uh, things like behavior and cognition. Important is the uh, primacy, the importance, the fundamental importance of a structural model 
of what goes on inside these systems. I want to stress that again. That is, I think, essential. A structural model of how components are connected to each other, which can then be used to <coughs> deduce uh, global functionality that results from these interactions. In the brain, and I really mean the human brain now, I'm going to talk mostly about humans, although uh, I think some of the concepts that I'll talk about carry over into animal models. It's not what I do in my own work, so I will mostly focus on the human brain. In the human brain, we have different ways of extracting network data. Um, and this is done now typically in two different ways. Uh, we can extract data on human brain anatomy, connectivity, physical connectivity of uh, interregional pathways, axonal pathways uh, that, that traverse the white matter of the cerebral cortex, for example. <coughs> that can be done with classical anatomical techniques, as it's been done historically, or now, uh, more recently, with non-invasive imaging techniques that attempt to infer the presence and course of these fiber pathways on the basis of diffusion imaging, for example. On, on in, in, in the right part of this image, different way of approaching the brain is recording time series data whether it's fMRI, EEG, MEG, or multi-electrode uh, recording data, these time series data can be converted into uh, a matrix of associations or correlations or covariances between recording, re uh, recorded elements that can be ne individual neurons or, in the case of whole brain, human imaging are typically voxels or regions of the brain. Regardless of the method, in the end, we end up with a des description. Sorry, that was a, the wrong button to press. Can I have that? Uh, can I have that back? Help. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll go through this again. I'll refresh everyone's memory, and uh, we are too far. Here we are. Back. There we are. Good. Um, both of these approaches yield a uh, mathematical object in the end, which is a network. A network is a set of nodes and edges. Nodes are the recording sites, so the voxels, the brain regions, the individual neurons from which data has been acquired. The edges between them uh, represent their association. They can be anatomical measures of connect connectedness, the density or strength of fiber pathways, or axonal connections or synapses. Or they can be dynamic uh, uh, measures of, dy of functional interactions, coupling, correlations, covariances, mutual information, a variety of measures are available. The key point is that once we have represented data about the structural or functional anatomy in this manner, we are interfacing with a large part of mathematics called graph theory that has been productively employed in many, many different scientific and technological disciplines. It's a very well understood part of math, one that has made a significant difference in many other scientific disciplines, not only social sciences, but also biology, chemistry, condensed metaphysics, etc. Neuroscience is one of the last disciplines where it's beginning to make a difference, actually, and I think that's um, going to be a, an exciting area in the future. Once we have graphs and networks, we can analyze these using quantitative methodologies. When I talk about networks, I'm not talking about networks in a metaphorical sense. I talk about networks in a mathematical, quantitative sense. We can actually measure things about networks that allow us to uh, understand the, uh, or the organization of the, of the data that we're actually looking uh, at with much greater detail. There are, different, there are many, many different ways of measuring things about networks using mathematical statistical approaches. They fall into three different categories that are relevant for neuroscience, at least three. We can, we can, we can assess the degree to which a neural network is uh, structurally segregated or consists of communities or modules of interacting nodes or, or neurons or brain regions that are more tightly coupled and more weakly coupled between each other. So we can access the community structure of the network, which is a very important goal, especially in now in functional neuroimaging. We can also assess the capacity to which the network can globally circulate or exchange information, and those are measures of functional integration. We can also ask questions about individual nodes and edges in the network. What is the extent to which they contribute to the network's integrity, to its functional uh, capacities, and to what extent uh, do they, do they uh, render the network vulnerable to attack? These individual node and edge roles are assessed by measures of functional influence, for example, centrality. Every time uh, any one of us uh, does a Google search, for instance, uh, essentially we're using a centrality algorithm, the Google PageRank algorithm, to rank uh, choices based upon whatever query we, we, we've made, uh, based on their sort of centrality, based upon the uh, centrality that they have relative to the query that we've made. <laughs>
So we're using centrality actually on a daily basis. In the, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we did not have very many connection data sets that were amenable to graph analysis. The very few examples we had came from the large scale anatomy of typically the mammalian neocortex. For example, the collection of uh, connections between segregated regions of the macaque visual and sensory motor cortex assembled by Fellerman and Van Essen about 20 years ago now. This is done with classical track tracing techniques. You get out of it an adjacency matrix where each of the uh, uh, squares here, the black squares, uh, indicates the presence of a, of a connection. And simple analyses can be performed that immediately gave us some information about what these uh, structures actually looked like. We found um, uh, that they were highly clustered, they had short path lengths, these are the two hallmarks of a small world network, and there was a modular community organization to it. There were certain communities of nodes which are more densely coupled and others are more, more, more weakly coupled with each other. And these modules were linked by highly influential hub nodes, which turned out to be nodes that were located in the parietal and prefrontal cortex. So that's an objective way using a mathematical approach to parse a connectivity structure, in this case a very s small data set really coming from a, a large scale uh, anatomical framework. If we looked at the individual regions in this matrix, we found that each one of them had unique sets of inputs and outputs, and that relates to its functionality. What a node does in the brain, a region, what kind of function a region performs is only partly the, the result of its internal workings or its internal circuitry, I think, and in part also is a reflection of the, the kind of relationships that it maintains with other regions in its neighborhood. For instance, if we cluster regions based upon the similarity of their inputs and outputs, as, as was done here by Klaus Hilgetag and Markus Kaiser, the communities that we retrieve uh, from, simply from this graph analysis uh, correspond to the known uh, sensory modalities that, that we know are uh, uh, exist in, in, in the macaque cortex. So uh, structure can predict something about function in this case. Structure can predict something about what functional community a region actually belongs to and what it might be doing. Now we had no information until several, uh, just a few years ago about similar data from the human brain. That was a big gap in our understanding uh, of, uh, of the human brain because we had no good structural model for it. We had a lot of imaging data which is uh, whatever you might think of it, uh, but it does not, you, it's very difficult to interpret imaging data on if you have no structural model by which it is generated. That was the uh, uh, reason why several, some of my colleagues and myself got together and wrote sort of a manifesto that said, we really need this data, and by the way, here's how we should do it, and we gave it a catchy name, the Connect Home, um, because I felt at the time that it was equally foundational for neuroscience as the genome is for the rest of biology. It is a structural, data set, a structural description in terms of connections, uh, either at the single neuron level, and that's very hard to get to uh, at, uh, today, but I think we will eventually get to it, or at the level at least of regions of the, of the human brain that are interconnected. We need to know the connectivity of the brain, otherwise we cannot make sense of all the functional aspects that we're measuring, of all the functional interactions uh, and, 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 uh, and interrelationships that, that, that appear uh, in in, in the brain at large. A few years ago then, or a couple of years ago, NIH uh, actually endorsed this to some extent, this, this research project, and came up with a, pro a program, the Human Connectome Project, um, which was announced in 2009, and I was lucky to, to hook up with a team of people uh, based primarily at Washington University and the leadership of David Van Essen, who has a relationship here with the Allen Institute and uh, we put in a, uh, what ended up being a winning application for the Human Connectome Project, which started, officially started about two weeks ago. So far, we're very much on time. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run, we'll run for, for the next five years. And uh, under the auspices of this project, uh, we will be uh, imaging uh, structural connectivity as well as functional connectivity. I'll say more about this in a moment. Task-evoked activation, behavioral data, and genomics in a cohort of 1,200 participants, many of which are coming from uh, a twin and uh, uh, from many of which are twins, which allows us to actually get at the heritability of many of the characteristics that we're going to, um, going to observe. This will unfold over the next five years. The data will be publicly available. 
And I believe there's efforts underway to link this also with the Allen uh, brain atlas, the human atlas, as it, as it emerges. Uh, a couple of years ago, preceding the NIH project, I got together with a young um, neuroimaging expert from, from Lausanne, uh, Patrick Hagman, who had um, uh, uh, acquired a very uh, uh, highly sensitive approach to, functional, to structural imaging of the human brain called diffusion spectrum imaging. And with it, uh, he was able to uh, essentially come up with a description of the human brain in terms of anatomical, putative anatomical fibers. I say putative because by nature, diffusion imaging is an inferential technique. This, this is done on live people. We don't take the brain out and dice it and, dice it and slice it. We actually put these people in a scanner for a matter of you know, maybe an hour or so and then acquire data sets and then infer from the uh, relatively obscure uh, physics signal that we're getting from the brain something about the, uh, the course and the uh, spatial distribution of white matter fibers inside the brain. Uh, we can take this uh, streamline, so -called, these so-called streamlines that we get from diffusion imaging, and we can build a network from that, which is shown here on the right. and was the first uh, high-resolution whole brain connectome that I uh, know of uh, in the literature. Uh, I, I compare it sometimes to a map of the planet uh, in the 16th century, which was more accurate in some places and less accurate in others. Nevertheless, quite useful in 1572 if you wanted to go across the Atlantic. I'd take this along, uh, even though it was slightly, uh, slightly inaccurate in places. I think the map we have right now, the one you see here on the right, is similar. There are some places that we've captured quite well, I think, others where we have clearly made uh, some mistakes still, and that needs to be further refined. Um, here's the connection matrix itself, just to show you what it looks like as a, uh, as a matrix. It's a sparse matrix. It's a weighted matrix, which tells you about the uh, putative magnitude of fiber pathways, and it's a matrix between 1,000 regions arranged more or less at random on the surface of the human brain. The upper right-hand quadrant is the uh, right hemisphere of the brain. The lower left-hand quadrant, sorry, upper left-hand quadrant is the, right, is the right hemisphere. The lower right-hand quadrant is the left hemisphere, and interhemispheric connections are on the offsides of, the, of, of, of this matrix. Um, we have done a lot of analyses on this already, quantitative analyses and, and modeling studies, about which I ca can say very little, uh, but there's primary literature certainly available on this. And we have good reason to believe that many of the connections, the majority of these connections, actually correspond to true anatomical fiber pathways. And I'll say something in a moment, in a moment about the validation aspect of this. Uh, we can extract community structure. We can ask questions about what brain regions are more highly interconnected and which ones are more weakly interconnected. We can ask questions about where the hub regions are in the, in the human brain. They, they tend to be actually on the midline, uh, across the midline of the two cerebral hemispheres. We can ask questions about the most highly central regions of the brain, and all these things can be asked in a quantitative uh, network science context. Um, I'm going to skip this one and go to the next. Validation for a moment. How do we know these fiber pathways are real since it's actually done without opening the skull, without actually looking at histology or anything like that? Uh, there's different ways to go about validating diffusion imaging data, and, and some of these are outlined here. We have actually pursued a couple of these avenues. One is by directly comparing to known uh, microscopic connection pathways that have been recorded for at least a couple of centuries. Uh, in anatomical atlases. If you do not have a superior longitudinal fasciculus, you probably have missed it in your data because it is there. We know where it goes. We know what it looks like. If we don't find it in our diffusion imaging data, then we've missed it. Uh, in fact, we haven't. It's, it's, it's actually in these data. Um, uh, the second approach would be to actually compare um, structural imaging uh, data, that, like the matrix I showed you before, to so-called functional connectivity, which is a very different imaging modality where we're looking at correlations, cross-correlations in the time series of fMRI fluctuations in the low frequency range that are recorded over the entire brain. Those, uh, uh, those correlations, uh, we believe, are driven by structural connectivity. Structural connectivity constrains the dynamics that, are, that occurs in the human brain. Uh, and if we can record the dynamics and the structural uh, connections independently of each other, and we sort of overlay them. We, we see how much of the functional connectivity can be explained on the basis of a forward model of the structural connectivity. Then we can actually come up with at least a measure of cross-validating cross these two imaging modalities with each other, and that works out to be quite well um, 
uh, uh, quite, qu uh, quite substantial and we see very good agreement between structural and functional connectivity obtained with these very different imaging approaches. Thirdly, uh, I think animal studies are essential here and uh, um, we've actually seen this picture before a couple of days ago. This is actually the macaque uh, uh, diffusion spectrum imaging data set from Van Verdeen's lab at, at MGH and uh, he had, uh, what he does is, is he takes post-mortem, a single hemisphere actually, puts that in a very uh, high field strength uh, small bore magnet, leaves it in there for four, 24 hours and gets very high resolution uh, uh, anatomy from the diffusion signal. And we can compare this to track tracing data. Track tracing data is often viewed as the gold standard in, 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 in large scale anatomy. Can't be acquired in human brains unfortunately because of the invasive nature of the procedure obviously. Uh, so we have to go to animal models to actually cross validate with track tracing. In the case of the macaque where we have um, done only one macaque hemisphere so far, we uh, get a fairly good agreement uh, between the uh, track tracing data coming from the COCOMAC database and the uh, uh, diffusion spectrum imaging data coming from Van Wedeen's uh, imaging run. <coughs> Future work surely to be done. I know that diffusion imaging is a somewhat controversial technique, especially with anatomists, because it is primarily based on imaging and on inference and computational procedures. However, I believe uh, we have a, a, a the glass is half full, as it were. We, 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 are, we are beginning to get very good uh, results with this technology. And the great advantage is we can do it on people that are alive. That is, we can actually then bring them back a year later. Uh, we can do longitudinal studies in development. We can do uh, studies of people who have uh, conditions uh, uh, of, of mental and, 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 and brain uh, disturbance. And we can ask questions about how connectivity is actually disordered in those cases. Uh, that's the, one of the great advantages of these approaches is that they are non-invasive. They allow us to deal with intact people and then bring them back, ask them questions, assess their behavioral performance, etc. Uh, I'm coming now to sort of towards the end here and I wanted to lay out a few of the open questions, okay, and uh, I, can, I can go through and uh, through these in, in, in whatever detail is, is, is necessary. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for, the, for a confluence of network science approaches, graph theory, complex systems, et cetera, and the emerging uh, science of connectomics, the emerging approaches at all scales, micro scale all the way up to macro scale, of mapping and recording brain connectivity. I think it's an essential uh, marriage, so to speak, that has to happen, because if we all we have is these huge data sets, uh, that come from either imaging or, or physiological recordings or array tomography, let's say, we need quantitative approaches to then make sense of all of this, to sort of reduce the data down to a pattern that we can actually interpret, where we can perform comparisons between individual subjects or between animals or humans in different disease states that give us quantitative metrics about what is actually different in these different conditions. So it's absolutely necessary that we have to develop uh, these kinds of approaches further and I think the Allen Institute uh, is positioned, perfectly positioned to actually push some of these developments forward. Um, we've learned a lot about this evidence for clustering, for hub neurons, uh, for small world architecture that actually is hi hierarchically arranged. A uh, very important subject is to uh, uh, get a feeling for the community uh, uh, structure of the brain what regions are more interactive with each other, which regions are more highly interconnected so they collaborate more often, share information, etc. And how are these different com communities integrated uh, in the course of, of uh, normal functioning? An important aspect also is the spatial embedding. Be why? Because the brain is a physical three-dimensional network and wiring, connections, axons, dendrites, they take up space and volume and metabolic energy. Uh, they need to be arranged in such a way that um, the brain actually fits. As I like to say, if your brain doesn't fit into, into your skull, you are not going to have any offspring, most likely. So that's an important constraint right here, and I think it points in the direction of potential um, uh, trade-offs between wiring optimization on one side and keeping the brain connected and well integrated on the other, which I think are, are, are crucial. Uh, let's see, what, what else do I have here? Um, functional <coughs> relationships uh, across the brain as assessed with uh, uh, recording techniques, neural recording techniques, imaging and so forth, uh, how are they related to the underlying structural substrate? Uh, 
Uh, we know that there are structural communities, communities of, of, of network nodes, brain regions that are more highly interconnected with physical connectivity. How does that shape their functional interactions as the brain engages in, 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 in ongoing activity or is perturbed by stimuli? Uh, what of which, which of these structural aspects are heritable, which ones are not? It turns out that a surprising to a surprising degree, macroscopic brain structure is, in fact, uh, heritable. And, uh, and uh, even very basic things like gray matter, uh, gray matter thickness, uh, wiring uh, uh, for certain pathways are very highly controlled by genetic factors, apparently. Uh, the combination of genomics approaches and connectomics approaches, I think, will reveal to a much greater extent uh, what this relationship actually looks like. Uh, human brain networks change across time, not just with experience, but also during development. We all start our lives with no neurons at all. And here we are having, I don't know, 100 billion or so uh, uh, available to us. How does this network actually grow? And there are studies that have been conducted recently also by myself and Alan Grant and Patrick Hagman that look at the structural connectivity, how it matures, how it goes from, from the age of, let's say, one or two year olds uh, all the way to young adolescents and how does, how does the network actually change across time and how does that relate to the emergence of cognitive uh, capacities along the way. Finally, a very important point, many brain disorders, perhaps all of them, not maybe not all of them, but many of them, uh, I think are mediated by disturbances of connectivity. This uh, includes autism, schizophrenia, certainly Alzheimer's and so forth. What characteristic patterns of network dysfunction, network disturbance are associated with each of these diseases? In the network science field and other contexts, internet, social networks, epidemiology, perturbations of networks are very important to study because people want to know what happens when we uh, lesion a network, what happens when we disrupt its functionality in terms of the global outcomes that result. I think we have a similar question on the horizon here for, for these uh, neurological psychiatric conditions. What is it about the brain that has changed in terms of its network architecture that it brings about or is, 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 is involved or at least associated with the function that is being perturbed? My final slide here I sort of put in uh, specifically for, for, for Paul Allen. I thought he might be interested in applications of this, potential applications of this uh, work for designing artificial intelligence systems. I, I, for many years, have been involved with people who work with robots and machine vision systems and so forth. And let's just say progress has been, hmm, it's, a, it's been an uphill battle. Um, we still don't have anything resembling the kind of general intelligence or, or robotic uh, 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 systems that we, that we would like to have in our environment. Maybe there's a different avenue to achieve this. Maybe it's not going through algorithms or cleverly designed uh, machine vision programs and so forth, but maybe it's by understanding something about the architecture of the human brain at a network level. Maybe there are some principles we can extract that help us guide these investigations in new directions. There's also a possibility now of designing global brain simulators, that is, computational models that can, in a sense, compute uh, behavior. Okay, I've, we had a wonderful conversation last night with, with Sidney Brenner, and, and he once again, you know, has always hit it on the hit the nail on the head uh, when he said the reason why connectivity, structural connectivity, should matter to us so much is because it might allow us to forward compute what the brain actually is doing in the context of behavior, let's say, and we, have, we haven't come to that point yet in our own work, but maybe more, 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 uh, more modestly put, uh, at least understand something about the spontaneous dynamics that we can record with fMRI or EEG or MEG recording techniques. And we have made progress in that regard. I, I'll show you down here one example from our own work. On the left is an empirical, I, I don't want to point because I'm going to uh, kill the presentation again. On the left there is a correlation seed map coming from empirical fMRI data. These are, this is an average of five Swiss left, uh, right-handed, well-adjusted uh, young males. I like to point out they're Swiss because I always think their brains are exquisitely wired. Um, uh, so that's, that's, so that's, that, that's empirical data. I hope I didn't offend anybody. Um, uh, that's empirical data. It's a seed map which typically represents correlations across the brain. And on the right uh, here is a computational model, 3,000 coupled differential equations with three, three uh, system variables at each node, essentially voltages, excitatory inhibitory, some conductance is thrown in, and coupled with the structural connectivity we got from these Swiss guys. And we can compute with, with a great degree of accuracy 
uh, something about the functional connectivity of this brain as it's spontaneously active. That's an example of forward computation. We've taken a structural model, some ingredients of biophysics, a structural coupling matrix, and then we get a, an, a, a signature out of this, a synthetic fMRI picture that we can now compare to the uh, um, uh, empirically derived uh, example. And that tells us something about how the empirical pattern might come about. It's actually uh, probably guided and, and shaped by the structural connectivity underneath. Uh, finally, uh, I'm very interested personally in lesion modeling, a project, separate project going on par in parallel to the connectome. Uh, if, we have the, if, I, if we have a structural model of the human brain, we can actually damage it in the computer. And we can ask questions about how impactful are certain lesions that we make inside this computational model. We make these lesions by deleting a number of nodes and their connections, and we then observe what the, how the dynamics, for, again in a forward computing sense, how the dynamics of the human brain changes as a result of making these lesions. Uh, we can then compare our empirical data to data that is obtained from people with stroke. And we can ask questions about recovery. Um, are there, is there anything about, what is it about the metrics of global brain connectivity, functional interactions, that changes in a a good outcome scenario, and is there anything we can do on an interventional uh, level with uh, therapeutic or other interventional means that uh, can guide uh, uh, brain repair and recovery in a good direction? Um, uh, the brain really is a complex network. If we make a lesion in our model in any particular spot, it's not just that that spot is lost and the rest of the brain just goes on doing what it's doing. All relationships across all other nodes in the brain change. And that's because the brain responds as a whole. This is something that becomes very plastic and very um, graspable if you do computational modeling, uh, and it really opens up uh, new horizons, I think, for understanding the impact, the functional impact of, of, of lesions and perhaps other disease states as well. I've come to the end, I think. I wanted to leave you with um, a few key messages here. I think the human brain, as I understand it, is a it's a complex network, uh, perhaps the most complex network that we have ever studied. It has many, there are many challenges that are still unmet, and yet we can make some, begin to make some progress understanding the brain from a network perspective, by which I mean a quantitative network perspective, not just uh, met metaphorical. Um, cognition is, in a sense, a global outcome of what this network is performing, what this network is doing to the extent it depends on neural dynamics, and I think it does, it is neural dynamics instantiated on a, on a structural description, which is the connectome. Uh, we, can, we can map, uh, and increasingly map in finer detail, the architecture of, of large-scale networks, and I sincerely hope that we will be able to also map these large-scale descriptions, sort of like the highways of, of, of the brain map, to the more fine, detailed descriptions that are derived from electrophysiological and anatomical studies at, at, at the smaller scale. These are very challenging uh, um, studies to, to, to conduct, and yet, ultimately, I think we need to link these levels up. Finally, uh, I think that uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of impact of, of, of connectomics in different aspects of neuroscience, including uh, brain repair and dysfunction, individual differences in heritability and development. And uh, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>